Good evening. Uh, my name is Linus Newell. I am Assistant Professor of Economics and Africana Studies. On behalf of Africana Studies, the Economic Department, I would like to welcome you to the annual Terry Gonway Memorial Lecture. Uh, now in its seventh year, we began this lecture series as a way to honor the life and work of Derek Gunway, who was um, the professor of economics here for 27 years. Uh, he also was the founding, one of the founding fathers of Africana Studies here at uh, the college. The other thing I would also like to note about Derek is that he was the first uh, black full faculty, well, full professor here at the college as well. He was a friend and mentor to many, uh, uh, many of our faculty. And I didn't have a chance to meet Derek personally. At the same time, when I listened to my colleagues talk, uh, I get a sense of how much they miss Derek. As noted in your programs here, uh, we originally started the Gunway Lecture as, um, well, using a grant from the Kiva family with the purpose of inviting speakers whose work sort of engages Derek's uh, uh, twin passions, if I can put it this way. And his passion was, of course, in economics, he was Professor of Economics. The other, one of his other passions was on social justice. To this end, over the past six years, we have invited speakers uh, in various areas of economics and social justice. In the very first year, we had uh, William Dariti, who is Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Duke University. Uh, we also had Derek's brother, Godal Gunway, who was Malawi's uh, finance minister. In 2008, we had the director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, uh, Tandika Kanawaya. In 2009, we had the ambassador, uh, US ambassador to Madagascar, Shirley Benz. In 2010, we had one of our former colleagues, uh, Mwangi Wakitinji. He is now at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. In 2011, we had Esther Kip, who is now a health specialist working on tuberculosis testing in Botswana. Last year, we received Kawala. Kawala is um, She's a human rights activist in Cameroon. In 2011, she was also a presidential candidate. Uh, I'm from Cameroon, if, if that helps. <laughs> I follow her quite a bit. Uh, elections are coming up in Cameroon uh, next year. And then one of the things she's doing now, she's running around trying to get her program going. In addition to the lecture series here at Gettysburg College, uh, the college uh, decided to honor Derek by naming the Consortium for Faculty Diversity Fellowship after him. Uh, the, what the fellowship does is that it supports uh, scholars from underrepresented groups who are interested in pursuing a career at a liberal arts institution. Uh, we have hosted over the past 11 years uh, scholars, and this year we actually have uh, we are, I, would, I might say we are fortunate to have two, two very talented scholars in the name of um, Christina Jackson in Africana Studies and Samuel Flores in the Classics Department. Both of them are here with us today. Before I let Brandon introduce our speaker for tonight, I would uh, take the chance to thank the Economics Department for sponsoring this uh, lecture. African Studies, as I mentioned, EPAC. And I would also like to recognize Derek's family who is here with us tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I would also like to recognize two very important people who have 
make sure that this night goes well, or at least we are here today. They have worked for months just to make it happen. Uh, Susan Gagowski is here, so holds. Please join me in thanking them for the work they have done. And I will let Brandon introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Linus. Uh, so I'm not from Cameroon. Uh, I'm from Long Island, and so is our speaker. So that's why I get to introduce him. Um, I am not going to read the bio that you can read in the program, because I figure you can read it in the program. I had a chance to talk to Jonathan Oster a little earlier this, this afternoon. And I asked him how, uh, how he, a guy like me from Long Island, ends up in Portland, Oregon, running the Opal Environmental Justice Oregon uh, nonprofit. And so it started out with an interest in high school in the uh, history of the civil rights movement in the United States that led him to the University of Pennsylvania, where that interest deepened and he was exposed to uh, issues of environmental justice and had the chance to work closely with some of the uh, some uh, important figures in the movement. And that led him ultimately to law school, and he started practicing environmental law and finds himself now as the, uh, in an unexpected role as the director of an organization he helped found. I, I hope he will explain uh, some of that in his talk tonight. Uh, but we are grateful to Jonathan for coming this evening and sharing uh, with us his experiences in environmental justice. So without further ado, Jonathan Austin. Thanks, Brendan, and um, I want to thank Linus for initiating this, uh, this request that brought me out here. And I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. This is a packed room. I don't know if it's always like this, or if there's just something so compelling about this talk that, uh, that folks want to come out and see, but it's an honor. Uh, I'm genuinely humbled and, pre and appreciative of, of the opportunity to come here tonight to speak to you all. Uh, and it's an honor to speak in the memory of, of Dr. Godway, um, who, of course, I didn't have the, the pleasure of knowing. And when Linus first approached me about giving this talk tonight, I was humbled, uh, but also perplexed uh, what, you know, uh, he just ran off a litany of the past seven speakers and what do they have all, they all have in common? They're, they're all, you know, from Africa uh, or doing work in Africa or around uh, African studies. Uh, and as Brendan so eloquently put it, uh, this white, white boy from, from <laughs> Long Island, uh, what, what could I possibly say tonight that would, that would do his memory justice? Uh, so I was a little, I had a little anxiety around that, which is which is unusual for me. I don't have too much anxiety. I never, only correction, I never practiced environmental law, but but employment law, civil rights law, and and if there's one thing that practicing law is good for, it's making me comfortable speaking in front of crowds and audiences and things of the sort. And yet I found myself anxious because how could I connect my work in a meaningful way to Dr. Gondway's work? And I reached out to faculty here on campus who, who knew him and the outpouring of, of kind words and insight um, and connection really overwhelmed me and made it a lot easier for me to figure out what I was gonna say to you tonight. So I really wanna appreciate the faculty that, that shared those insights with me, particularly those who knew uh, Dr. Gondway well. And um, he seemed to be a passionate advocate for communities, first and foremost and for collaborating with government at times in order to remove barriers to equal opportunity, barriers to prosperity. And that's the work that we all do in this movement. Um, he seemed to value both community organizing and policy advocacy equally. And that's very important to hold both of those simultaneously. He also valued, perhaps above all else, critical thinking and intellectual honesty very important in the work that we do because the work around the social justice movement, around the environmental justice movement is challenging. Uh, and if we're not rigorous in our thinking and critical in our thinking, willing to challenge ourselves, willing to challenge others, we're not going to advance this work. 
So while I never had the privilege of knowing him, uh, I hope to frame this talk in a way that reflects his spirit, his values, uh, and also do his legacy justice and, and, and share in this brief moment that we have together some reflection about the work um, and about his life. And of course this moment today is rich with history. I, I don't think anybody here at Gettysburg College can forget that it's been 150 years since the, the famous battle, the Emancipation Proclamation first, the, the battle that I had, had the pleasure of seeing today is literally right up against uh, uh, the town. Um, it's also been um, 150 years since President Lincoln's commemoration that followed perhaps the, the greatest two minute speech of all time. Uh, I wish I could say what I'm gonna to say tonight in two minutes. Um, I'll be a little bit longer than that. Um, but I, I think the most, uh, for me, the, the, the most important thing from President Lincoln's uh, address 150 years ago today, not today, this year, um, was that the work, the work that was initiated, that was put into motion 150 years ago, the work of freedom, the work of equality, wasn't finished. And a hundred years after that speech, Dr. King, speak 50 years ago this year, just recently, speaking on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., he understood very well that that work was unfinished. And that's something that we have to remember today, 50 years later, after Dr. King's speech that this work remains unfinished, and it will remain unfinished unless we all take up the cause and approach the work in a way that's gonna to lead to transformative change. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. Because it's only our complacency, it's only our deep proclivity for self-deception, our willingness to believe in the myth of post-racialism that is going to keep us from finishing this work. And why do we believe in this myth? Why are we so easily deceived? Why do we so easily deceive ourselves? Perhaps because it hurts to do that. Perhaps because the work is too challenging. Um, but nevertheless, that myth of post-racialism is perhaps the most dangerous thing that we face here today in 2013 America. So as we celebrate and reflect upon this historic moment in time, uh, we should consider whether we've made meaningful progress towards the shared dream. And by some measures, certainly we have. I think only the most cynical among us could ignore the hope that lies, particularly within a younger generation, within a very diverse younger generation the hope that's being nurtured by growing up in the age of Obama. Um, who here in this room, who among us could, could foretell what impact that's going to have as this younger generation matures in a changing demographic, changing landscape in this country? Um, we've now started a process of, symbolically at least, normalizing the ultimate equal opportunity. And so we shouldn't be cynical of that accomplishment. We shouldn't belittle that accomplishment. But neither should we allow ourselves to rest on that symbolic laurels. Because it is just a symbol. It's a racial symbol. But the substance of the work remains. And it's our obligation, it's our duty to do that work. Uh, as I'll, I'll try to limit my tangents tonight, but one, but one mini tangent that I have is you know, living in, in Portland, Oregon is very um, wonderful at times and frustrating at times. And partially why it's frustrating is because there's a, a dominant, progressive, very polite, white culture in Portland. Um, that can be hard to swallow, particularly for an East Coast kid like myself. Um, and, and part of what I hear all around me is this, this frustration with Obama. We're so, so, so mad at him. He's not delivering. And what I find is that people didn't listen didn't listen to what he was saying. Obama was never the radical leftist. Not once during his candidacy did he give some radical leftist speech. He was very moderate. Everything he said was moderate. And yet we, we put all our hopes 
and expectations in this one man, which is impossible. Really what Obama has done is created space for us to do the work. And only we can fail ourselves by failing to heed that caution, by failing to do the work, by expecting one man to carry the day. It's not gonna happen, right? Okay, tangent over. Um, so we have some positive progress to be sure, and we should, we should celebrate that. Um, but by many objective measures, by many objective metrics, we've stalled out. Or worse, we are losing ground. Despite more awareness than ever, at any, any point in history, racial health disparities not only persist, but increase. How can that be? Tens of thousands of people of color, predominantly young black men, are incarcerated at this very moment for nonviolent drug offenses. Offenses that are committed, but not enforced equally among us. How can that be? And perhaps most frightening as a civil rights lawyer um, is the systematic dismantling of our civil rights laws by not only our courts, but also by our local and state governments, and a failure of us, the, the body politic, to rise up and defend those laws and advance those laws where they were insufficient. And I believe that the myth of post-racialism is as dangerous today as the social construct of race has been over the course of humanity. Um, the myth of post-racialism allows us to collectively declare mission accomplished without remedying any of the egregious or persistent harms that have been committed over generations. And um, I believe that environmental justice offers a path forward. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight. Uh, before I do, in thinking about Dr. Ganwe's life and his work, particularly having received some of this insight from people who knew him here on campus, I, I was curious, I wondered whether he ever had the, the privilege or whether he and, and another, uh, his tokayo, as our, our hermanos, the hermanos from the South would call somebody who share a, a same name and perhaps the same spirit, his tokayo, Dr. Uh, Derek Bell. I wonder if the two of them have ever met. I don't know. If anybody here knows, tell me. Um, both Dr. Gondway and Professor Bell were pioneers. They were both the first black academics to receive tenure at their respective institutions. They both served as, as models. They served as mentors. They served as champions for younger faculty, particularly faculty of color. Both were, in their own ways, civil rights advocates who uh, unflinchingly pursued diversity and scholarship opportunities for students and academics of color. And that was before it became fashionable to do so. Both were critical thinkers who spoke truth to power. They both spoke truth to power. And both were courageous in that endeavor. So in this spirit, let's reflect for, for a moment on the teachings of critical race theory, for which we owe a, a lot of gratitude to Professor Bell, who passed away recently, a few years ago and so. Um, through critical race theory, we understand a few things. We understand that racism is not the anomaly that dominant white culture wants to believe it is. Uh, it's the last respite, it's not the last respite, rather, of those few remaining bigots that might be hiding out in those southern shadows, those out and out bigots that we can all declare to be bad people. Right? Racism is the norm. Racism is ubiquitous. And it's all around us, and it's felt every day by people of color, whether it's through these racial microaggressions that are very subtle and pernicious and not easily identifiable, largely by a lot of progressive, passive white folks, or racism that's felt through the workings of our institutions and our structures, our laws or policies. We know a thing or two about this in Portland. I, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here. Um, we also understand from critical race theory that history and context matter. History and context matter. We can't simply hit the reset button. Many would like us to, to do that, right? Um, 
while we may not be individually culpable here today in 2013 for the acts that may have been committed by our forebears, we are nonetheless accountable to collectively remedy those injustices because those harms persist today. We can't divorce ourselves from the past. Finally, critical race theory teaches us that in contrast to the belief that our progress along <laughs> racial equality, racial justice, even the Emancipation Proclamation, as many critical race theorists and scholars have pointed out, the belief that, that these moments represent some, some momentary enlightenment, some enlightening moment where dominant society, dominant culture has had the, that light bulb <coughs> go off, right? Um, critical race theory teaches us that these ostensibly enlightening moments were actually most likely the result of interest convergence. Convergence of interest between dominant and subordinate cultures. So we should be careful to allow these symbolic moments of progress to convey a sense of post-racialism, or that the work is finished, because it's only just begun. And these supposed gains, the supposed progress, all too often, it's just a smokescreen. All too often, it placates us from seeing or tre achieving true justice. Uh, our civil rights laws are examples of this smokescreen. These laws are largely based on something that we call the perpetrator model. It focuses on a single bad actor trying to stamp out very specific intentional conduct. Intentional discrimination is illegal, but the results, the effects of the collective discriminatory conduct, well, that's just the way the market works. Right? As opposed to a victim model of the law, which focuses on making victims whole, on remedying wrongs, regardless of the intent. This was no accident. Make no mistake, this was by design. We have to be very clear about that, that these laws were written to perpetuate the status quo. All too often these laws are premised on a notion of procedural justice, which comes often at the expense of distributive justice, outcomes, or corrective justice, making victims whole, holding wrongdoers accountable. And we can take a quick examination of our seminal civil rights laws and see how insufficient they are in this regard. Think about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, potentially one of the most powerful pieces of legislation ever passed in this country. The intention to prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, in the expenditure of federal dollars. If the true intent and purpose of President Kennedy's vision were to have been effectuated, think about the radical restructuring that would have brought about in our society. Transportation, housing, schools, parks, infrastructure, health and opportunity. But the Supreme Court in 2001, per Justice Scalia, in a case called Alexander v. Sandoval, ensured that, at least under his watch, this radical restructuring, this true equal access to the pooled benefits of our shared taxpayer dollars would not come to fruition. By declaring that Title VI prohibited intentional discrimination only, and not the effects of that discrimination, the majority made clear that communities of color were not entitled to a fair distribution and an equal benefit from the billions of annual taxpayer dollars that the federal government gives to the states, which then comes through to our local communities. Title VI at one point held a lot of potential and a lot of promise. It's been largely decimated, although you see advocates working to restore 
some of the legitimacy and the power of 106, what we call a Sandoval fix. Uh, we don't use that in DC because then it's a code speak and Republicans they, they get all crazy and shut it down. So we have to be a little careful with how we frame that. Think about some of the other civil rights laws as well. Title Seven. Title Seven prohibits discrimination in in the workplace. This is what I practiced for, for five years. Plaintiffs, mostly plaintiffs side employment law, racial discrimination work, sexual harassment work. It's only marginally better than Title VI. It remedies some individual acts. It rarely can stop or remedy patterns of discriminatory conduct against classes of people. It allows a lot of discrimination to go unbated reframes a lot of discriminatory conduct as pretextual, legitimate business purposes, or our favorite term of art, bona fide occupational qualifications. Even Title VIII, the Fair Housing Act, which was passed in 1968 in the wake of Dr. King's assassination, it's the last refuge today of what we call the disparate impact rule, disparate impact being the result, the effect, of conduct regardless of intent. It's on shaky ground. Most uh, most analysts, most, most experts think that the court in taking up a, a Fair Housing Act case for this next term is, are going to uh, do away with the disparate impact rule given their track record recently. So we're, we're worried that we're gonna lose one of those last holdouts of disparate impact in fair housing. You all depressed here? <laughs> hold, just hold it, just hold it. We'll come out the other side together. None of these examples, Title VI, Title VII, Title VIII, none of these examples are even the most pernicious illustration. I'm gonna take you a little bit lower, okay? Perhaps the most pernicious illustration of the current attack on civil rights is the recent Supreme Court decision just from this last June limiting the Voting Rights Act and the immediate subsequent steps that were taken by states, certain states, states with historic voter discrimination, to suppress the vote by people of color and entrench disenfranchisement. It's been 48 years since um, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. August 6, 1965, and upon doing so, he declared that today is a triumph for freedom as huge as any victory that has ever been won on any battlefield. And to be sure, this was a very important step in helping to build upon that unfinished work that was initiated 150 years ago, right outside our campus here. The Voting Rights Act led to the abolition of the literacy tests led to the abolition of poll taxes. It made possible the registration of millions of voters of color. Forced states with a history of voting discrimination to clear any electoral changes with the Department of Justice before it took effect. This was the provision, section five, that was just eradicated by the court. And it laid the foundation for a new generation of elected officials and elected officials of color in the subsequent 48 years. According to the US Census in 2012, this past year, 73% of eligible black citizens nationwide are registered to vote. More than double what it was in 1965. Uh, in the 2012 election, for the first time in recorded <coughs> history, the percentage of registered black voters percentage of their turnout exceeded that of white voters for the first time in history. And we're all mindful, if we are paying attention to the demographic shifts, we're all mindful of the growing Latino electorate and what effect that, have had, that has had on recent elections. Uh, the API, the Asian Pacific Islander community, is not far behind. Hopefully this changes the face of the American electorate and the face of our elected leadership for generations to come. That's the hope. But this Supreme Court decision from, from late June, Shelby County versus Holder, 
it threatens to roll back many of these gains. This was the most effective provision in the most effective civil rights law, and it's now dead. And the states with the worst history of voter suppression have moved very fast, very quickly, in just, what, less than three months to fill that road. But before we talk about some of the worst steps taken by the worst offenders, be clear about one thing, this is not a new battle. Chief Justice Roberts has been trying to weaken the Voting Rights Act ever since he was a foot soldier in the Reagan administration in the early 80s, working for the Department of Justice. This has been a decades-long battle. Section 5, since 1965, since the law was passed, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the section that Justice, Justice Roberts just, no, just declared is no longer justified. Why? Because racism is no longer the problem that it once was. That's the court's justification. This section has enabled the Department of Justice to block more than a thousand discriminatory voting changes from going into effect in the last 48, 48 years, protecting access to the ballot box for hundreds of thousands of voters of color. So attempts at voter suppression are alive and well today. This is not some historic vestige. This is real today in 2013. In the two years leading up to the presidential election in 2012, 41 different states, through a combined 180 bills, attempted to restrict voting rights in just two years leading up to the 2012 election. Since the ruling, Section 5 had previously protected voters from the worst of those laws going into effect. Since the ruling in June, six southern states that were previously covered under the Voting Rights Act have implemented new voting restrictions seeking to suppress the vote. I won't go into uh, all the examples, because then we'll really be depressed, but, I'm, but I am going to give you the worst. <coughs> the worst. North Carolina, very recently. The worst of the new voter suppression laws. They eliminated practically everything that was encouraging people to vote, <coughs> replacing it with unnecessary and overly burdensome restrictions. The new law in North Carolina requires a government-issued voter ID to cast a ballot, even though the state's own data, not civil rights advocates' data, but the state's own data, shows that at least 318,000 registered voters lack that acceptable form of ID. And there hasn't been a single prosecution for voter impersonation in the last 10 years. The law eliminated a week of early voting in North Carolina and eliminated same-day registration for early voters. Even though 56% of North Carolinians voted early in 2012, over half, and a healthy 96,000 voters took advantage of that same day registration. So what exactly is the problem that North Carolina is trying to solve? What's the problem? It's the voter turnout by communities of color. It's the power that the Voting Rights Act was in, enabling communities of color to build through their franchise. Make no mistake, this is racial suppression. The now Republican state legislature is surely alarmed that 28% of early voters, 33% of the same day registrants, and 34% of voters without state issued IDs in North Carolina in 2012 were black, even though they made up only 23% of the electorate. But remember the teachings of Professor Bell in critical race theory. This is not an anomaly. This is the new and old normal. Back again, rearing its ugly head again. Our civil rights laws were always insufficient. By themselves, they were never going to accomplish the task of stamping out racial injustice. But now more than ever, we're ill-equipped to remedy the harms of racial discrimination. And this is a fact that we have to face. OK, let's all breathe. It's depressing. Right? So what are we going to do? What are we going to do in 2013? 
to overcome some of the losses that we would feel. But before we figure that out, we have to figure out what our goals are. What's our aim? We cannot simply seek more transactional change. We can't seek more of the same, because transactional change is a diversion. It's a diversion from that unfinished work. We have to get back on the path to transformative change. So what's that? What's transformative change? How, does, how do you achieve transformative change? I'm not gonna lie and say it's easy, but we also shouldn't pretend that it's some utopian fantasy that we can't work towards, that we can't achieve. The worst thing that we can do today is to succumb to what we call dominant control myths. Everybody knows what dominant control myths are, even if you've never heard that, that frame. Dominant control myths are intended to perpetuate the status quo. It's the, the kind of stuff that you hear, well, that's just the way things are. Or, what are you gonna do about it? Right? Or the most common one that you'll hear, and maybe this is a, for older folks in the room, but you can't fight City Hall. Right? Dominant control myths that are intended to keep us complacent and maintain the status quo. So we should take to heart the example that's being set right now by our brothers and sisters in North Carolina who are refusing to just get along. They're risking arrest, they're risking worse to challenge the injustices that they're facing in their state. The lessons that are embedded within Moral Mondays are age-old lessons. They're not new in the fight against injustice. We win through community organizing. We win through story-based strategies. We win through empowerment, through leadership development, inspiration, and above all, we win with love. That's how we win. That's how we get on the path towards transformative change. Well, so now you're thinking, well, is this just some hippie guy from Portland, Oregon? Okay, well, let's put this, let's make this real, right? All of these elements are present in the environmental justice movement. The environmental justice movement is the true legacy of our civil rights struggles. But before we get into the intricacies of the movement, and I'll talk about some of the work we do at Opal out in Portland, I want to first talk about stories. I want to talk about leadership. Because what I found in my 15 some odd years doing this work is there's a myth about leadership, just like there's a myth about a lot of things. Right? We, uh, we, we tend to, to believe in this fallacy that there are leaders and there are followers. And oh, well those leaders, there's something special or different about them. That's them, that, that can't be me. Um, we put too much stock in other people. We don't put enough stock in ourselves, in our own potential, in our own abilities. Those who lead, not leaders, those who lead, in a moment, that could be all of us, any of us at any given time, those who lead uh, there's a great TED talk about this, by the way. Those who lead do so for one primary reason. They can communicate the why. They can communicate why they believe what they believe. They can communicate why they do what they do. And it's only after communicating the why, persuasively, genuinely, can they then inspire others to join them in the how and the what. Usually we see it backwards. We gotta get it right. It starts with the why, and then it moves to the how and the what. If you don't know the why, and you can't communicate the why, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna be running in place. Think about those 250,000 activists, about a quarter of whom were white, who marched on Washington 50 years ago to hear not just Dr. King speak, but a whole lineup of powerful speakers of inspirational speakers with just as much accomplishment as Dr. King at the time. They were there because they believed in the why. They believed that they couldn't live free unless everyone lived free. They believed simply in the why, and they shared a unity of purpose, and they came together around that unity of purpose. Now, to figure out the why for our work, whatever we're doing, we need to start with something called the story of self. Why you are who you are. 
why you care about the values that you care about. Once you can communicate, once you can articulate, once you know your own identity and your own story, only then can you connect your values with others, our shared values, our unity of purpose, the story of us. You move from the story of now to the story of us, and from the story of us, only then can you motivate others to join into collective action. And we call that the story of now, or what Dr. King said, the fierce urgency of now. Now, those of you in the room who are, who are down with this, you should be thinking about Marshall Gans right now. Marshall Gans is, uh, hopefully some of you are thinking about Marshall Gans. He's one of uh, my, my heroes, my mentors, um, one of the most prominent remaining civil rights advocates today. He, uh, like me, grew up Jewish in New York. He was going to law school at NYU. He dropped out in the early 60s to go down to Mississippi and join the Freedom Riders. He did that for one very clear, simple reason. He felt like his endeavors were worthless, were fruitless, were without meaning, unless everybody enjoyed the same access and privileges that he did. Until everybody was free. After working uh, with, the, with civil rights advocates and, and the Freedom Riders in, in the South, he went uh, west, and he was the right-hand man for Cesar Chavez in the UFW, United Farm Workers. Uh, he then went on to help advise then-candidate Obama in 08, in his initial election. Now he teaches at, at Harvard, he teaches community organizing and, and story-based strategy, story-based narrative development at Harvard. But Gans's story actually is not that unique. Maybe today it might be, but at the time it wasn't. There were many young students, many white privileged students from the North who left their homes in the relative safety and comfort they enjoyed to join in the struggle for freedom in the South. The story that had the greatest impression upon me as a first as a high school student in my, in my history course um, was the story of, of three young men, two white men and one black man from, from the North, Andrew Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, and James Cheney. They, they left their relative comfort up North to go down South to help register black folks to vote. And often they did so under the threat of bodily harm. Um, and why did they do this? Why? They had to. They didn't have a choice. They couldn't be free unless everyone was free. And many of us know how this story ended. Uh, after taking a side trip to investigate a church bombing in Philadelphia, Mississippi, they were arrested by a local sheriff. They were passed off to the local Klansmen who had conspired, plotted their murder. They were shot and killed. The car was burned and their bodies were buried. And their disappearance set off a federal investigation. Uh, only recently, actually, were, were many of the perpetrators brought to justice. In reading about the stories and the history and the more recent developments, I, I often wondered whether, whether Mickey Schwerner's widow was right. She said that the only reason the story made news and persists in the national consciousness today was because two of the young men were white. Had it been three black young men who disappeared while registering other black folks to vote in the South, which happened more than we could ever know wouldn't have passed for news. So that's always struck with me. Regardless, what it illustrates is the power of story to speak with us, to move us. I'm, I'm reminded of a, a, a quote I love by Salman Rushdie. He said, those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as times change. Those people are truly powerless because they can't pick new thoughts. Let's not underestimate the power of stories. Learning about these young men's ultimate sacrifice, going into the heart of darkness, knowing the risks, forced into action nevertheless, it's affected me in ways that I'm only just beginning to really understand. Civil rights became a passion for me. Back in the late 90s, at, as an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, 
Only the most privileged and, and ignorant among us could fail to notice the stark disparity between the, the lives that we lived as students, the educational opportunities, the generational opportunities that were afforded us, and the lives that were eked out by many of the surrounding residents of West Philadelphia. It was uh, certainly a good place to begin this work and to start reconciling my own privilege with whiteness, with class, with gender, with access and influence. So that's work that we all have to start doing for ourselves in order to get into this work meaningfully. Once we immerse ourselves in the world of people with a commitment to intellectual honesty, with a commitment to speaking truth to power, we can't turn back. What I found when I was an undergrad was that none of the typical student activism of the time really interested me. Stop sweatshops in some remote place of, of you know area of the world that I had never been. Save the environment in some remote corner of the world that I likely would never go. Multinational corporations are bad. Okay, I'm not here to belittle causes. Um, it just felt dishonest. And it's not, it wasn't dishonest for me because the tragedies weren't real. There are tragedies unfolding all around the world at every moment of every day. And there certainly is a connection between the privilege that we enjoy as Americans and our foreign relations and globalization, which we perpetuate, and these tragedies that are unfolding all around the world. The reason it felt dishonest is because it was painfully clear to me living in West Philadelphia, that we have deep and dark inequities and injustices right here in our own backyard, involving real people, our neighbors, people we see every day. And I don't know why some of us are pulled towards action in the hopes of saving communities halfway around the world, but can't seem to muster any energy, any effort to engage in the struggles in one's own backyard and one's own community. I'm not sure why that is. It's complicated. Perhaps it has to do with the degree to which racism has entrenched itself in our national consciousness, in our structures, in our daily lives. Perhaps it's because it's difficult. What, uh, what Professor John Powell of the Kirwan Institute calls structural racialization, a different way of talking about institutional racism, perhaps a new way, a way that can bring some new, fresh energy into the work, structural racialization, how through the workings, the intrinsic workings of our structures, our policies, our laws, our governance, we create areas of opportunity and sacrifices. And typically it's along race and class lines. And this was certainly true in Philadelphia when I was there in the late 90s. I stumbled into some research that looked at the relative levels of lead contamination in municipal water supplies. For those of you who don't know, uh, West Philly, where the school was, where UPenn was, and North Philly were largely, overwhelmingly, I would say, poor and black, where Center City, and to some degree South Philly, was largely more affluent and white. And they were served by two different water supplies. And you can guess which one had unhealthy levels of lead contamination. This was my first exposure to the concept of environmental justice. It was a door to the path that I'm currently on. Um, and I learned that environmental justice is a frame for pushing civil rights and social justice through a lens of environmental health. It focuses on empowering communities, communities of color, low-income communities, that often bear a disproportionate share of the burdens of our collective decision-making without any of the benefits. It also addresses inequitable access to decision -making. We work to create opportunities for meaningful participation, not token participation, but meaningful participation. And what does that mean? It means the opportunity, the genuine opportunity, to influence the outcomes. You have to be informed. You have to have the technical assistance, the technical capacity to understand that information. You have to be able to access the very levers of decision making itself, the ears of those decision makers, not their proxies, not their subordinates. Ultimately, environmental justice is like all movements for justice. It's about power, and it's about self-determination. It's a movement that was started in Warren County, North Carolina, 
very, very, at the time, in the early 80s, a poor black community in North Carolina, mostly, mostly rural. The community saw toxic landfill after toxic landfill being sited in their, in their, their area, in their community. They called it what it was, environmental racism. This work has been carried on by organizations like We Act, West Harlem Environmental Action, who fought against the concentration of public bus depots in Harlem. There are loads and tons of toxic diesel, particular matter. Why were all those bus depots concentrated in Harlem and not in the Upper East Side? Power, privilege, race. This work is fought in Cancer Alley, that stretch of godforsaken land and river between North Carolina, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where most of our PVC facilities are. Some of the poorest communities of color in the country. Why are those facilities there? Power, privilege, and race. The spike rages on in New Orleans itself, post-Katrina. Those who remain after the storm are battling to hold on to a piece of their land, while speculators and developers are licking their chops, gentrifiers are licking their chops, eager to get their hands on that prime real estate. Does anyone here really think that the Army Corps of Engineers are not going to rebuild that levee to withstand a Class 5 storm once that property turns over? Power, privilege, and race. It's fought in the farmer communities, in rural counties. Decent, hardworking people are struggling to earn a day's pay and steer clear of harsh working conditions. Why are farm workers exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act? Why are they exempt from the National Labor Relations Act? Power, privilege, and race. And it's a battle that's carried on by the LA Bus Riders Union who are fighting for the soul of their city. Public transit is a lifeline opportunity for many wealthy folks and folks of color, particularly in urban environments. That it happens to also be good for triple bottom line and sustainability, that it's good for the economy, that it's good for the environment and social equity, it's merely convenient. But why aren't we collectively funneling billions of dollars into running public transit systems in urban environments, away from roads and freeways? Because power, privilege, and race are entrenched. Environmental justice has even made its way out to our sleepy little corner of the country in, in Portland, Oregon. Portland is a, a true tale of two cities. Uh, show of hands who's seen the show Portlandia? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not so many, actually. I think there'd be more. Um, there is a Portlandia. It exists. It's real. It's a bubble. The urban core. Uh, it's got unrivaled quality of life, which you can access if you have a little bit of disposable income and a little bit of education. But the other Portland is outside this bubble, and it's like a lot of other struggling communities around the country. Concentrated pockets of poverty, attractive cheap housing, poor transit service, food deserts, lack of parks and open space, lower life expectancy, worse overall health conditions resulting from a multitude of built environment factors. So Opal Environmental Justice was established to build power around the intersection of these issues. Transportation justice, expanding housing choice and mobility, access to living wage jobs, and health equity in communities in which we live, work, play, and pray. And I just want to take a few minutes, we're about out of time, just to talk about a little bit of the work that we do. So we talk about sustainability, but true sustainability has equity embedded within it. There's some great work happening down in Southern California at the University, uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor, who talks about equity as a superior growth model, <coughs> supporting those with the most skin in the game. And actually, regions can outperform other regions if economically, if they pursue equitable strategies. This urban environmental justice frame really mirrors what Obama's doing with the Sustainable Communities Initiative, the combining of HUD, the DOT, and the EPA, some grant opportunities. Our primary focus is on transit justice. We essentially run a union for bus riders, for transit dependent riders. We want a fair distribution of transit benefits and burdens and meaningful involvement in decision making. It's a membership program, and leadership is reserved for those who are most impacted by transportation decision making, transit dependent folks. Because if we're not building leadership for <coughs> those who are most impacted, we're not going to build movement. We also work on housing choice and mobility. 
The big issue that we work on is inclusionary zoning. There's actually only two states in the country that have prohibited the use of inclusionary zoning, which is a land use tool that allows jurisdictions to build mixed income housing. It's one thing to build a lot of affordable housing in a concentration. It's another thing to integrate housing choice within the same development, a mix of units and different housing at different income levels. And inclusionary zoning is the best tool. It's the number one anti-gentrification tool. Two states that have prohibited it, Oregon and Texas. So I'm hoping that this dispels your notions of progressive Oregon. We're fighting to repeal that prohibition. Economic opportunity and green jobs. We want our employers to be able to provide transit benefits. We want more than just 40% of the jobs to be accessible by a 90 minute transit ride. It's a long commute on transit, not more. Bus drivers are green jobs. How come we don't talk about bus drivers as green jobs? Every bus that's on the road is 270 something cars that are on the road. Why isn't that a green job? We gotta talk about, we gotta frame the issue right. Finally, we wrap everything up in health equity work. People of color, low-income communities are disproportionately exposed to on-road mobile emissions. Why? They live in disproportionate numbers near freeways, major roads, freeways, throughways, largely in affordable housing. <coughs> we use affordable housing as buffers in this country in ways that would make the Chinese blush. East Portland residents out in Portland they have a higher mortality rate due to these risks from built environment. Um, and we know that riding transit can meet the, uh, the CDC's daily recommended levels of, of physical activity. We need to be promoting the health equity of equitable investments as well. If we can't quantify it, and if we're stuck in a cost benefit frame, we're always gonna be playing catch up. Right? It's hard to monetize, it's hard to quantitatively put a, to put a monetary value on some of these health equity results. We have, to, we have to develop the story and advance the story. So I want to close by talking about what I think is, other than this myth of post-racialism, it's really close, uh, ugly stepchild. And that's equity speak. Equity speak. It's threatening to derail our environmental justice movement. Um, progressive Portland is a test case for this. Equity seems to be the new buzzword. Just like sustainability was yesterday, just like smart growth was before that, dominant culture appropriates these means, chews them up, spits them out. What does equity mean? I, I have no idea. I have no clue. Right? I know what justice means. Justice means the direct participation of those who are most impacted, and hopefully the leadership of those who are most impacted. Working to remedy those harms, holding those who are responsible accountable, whether it's a single bad actor or all of society. Think of that poor community in North, in North Carolina, in Warren County, who kicked off this movement by declaring this environmental racism. We knew exactly what they meant. We know what they mean when they say environmental racism. What did the government do? Oh, it can't be about race. The site, this decision, this permit is facially neutral. It's colorful. There's nowhere in this process to consider race. We didn't intend for this outcome to be racialized. As Ivan Illich once famously paraphrased an old adage, to hell with good intentions. We need outcomes. And that goes for facility siting, whether it's landfills or bus depots, it goes for the diversity of faculty in academic institutions. We need more than good intentions, we need outcomes. And think about what happens when you say, oh, it's not race, it's not, it's not justice, it's equity, equity, I'm okay with equity. Dominant culture is comfortable with equity speak. Why is that? When you shift to equity speak, who's responsible? We all are. So who's accountable? Nobody. No one's accountable. Right? It perpetuates the status quo in that way. It threatens to undermine our fight for justice. 
EJ, environmental just suffers hope of transformative change because it requires direct participation, education, movement building of those most impacted, and it focuses on the root causes, racism, inequitable social capital, the externalities in our market. Saul Alinsky, once, you know, the godfather of community organizing, once put it very succinctly, he said, the very act of acquiring power, power is potentially confrontational. I can't give you power, because if I can give it to you, I can take it away, it's not real power. The only way you can acquire power is by organizing and taking it for yourselves. Because in the end, that's what it means to be a great community organizer. It's about owning your own story, it's about communicating the why, and ultimately it's about doing the work through love. And I wanna leave you with a, one of my favorite quotes by a famous French writer, philosopher, aviator, poet, Antoine de saint And to me, it communicates or encapsulates the transformative change that we're all after. The why of the work. He said, if you want to build a ship, don't herd people together to collect wood. Don't assign them tasks and assign them work. But rather, teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Thanks. <laughs>